right. Welcome, everyone. And uh, thank you, as always, for having me, AOC pm &R. I'm really glad to be able to present on a case study. Obviously, the last one was me and my shoulder, but now this one is actually a hypothetical um, patient or client who uh, ha has been diagnosed with knee osteoarthritis and metabolic syndrome. And part of the reason why I wanted to combine these, and this will actually be an ongoing thing, is because the exercise science guidelines tend to, and I can only speak for the field of exercise science, but they tend to silo things into what you should do for one condition versus what you should do for another condition. And people rarely present with conveniently with just one condition. Uh, so many times they'll have um, multiple musculoskeletal conditions, sometimes seemingly, at least from my standpoint, conflicting um, musculoskeletal conditions. And my, my uh, go-to example of that was the first time I was ever referred to, excuse me, someone with um, lumbar stenosis who also had lumbar um, herniated discs. And so the way I viewed that was, oh, you know, what am I supposed to do with this person? They, they can't go into much extension, but they also got, have to be wary of um, flexion, rotation, and the combination of each. Does that mean we can't move? Um, but in any case, it's, it's to me, in the, in, since I live in the field of fitness, this makes things confusing a lot of times for um, fitness professionals because when you're combined, you know, now what do I do? And that's the reason why I want to move forward with these presentations and case studies and just combine things. Sometimes it'll be a musculoskeletal combined with uh, some sort of um, chronic disease. And other times it'll be multiple musculoskeletal, but um, hopefully that'll just make it a little bit more enticing for the um, viewers. So in any case, moving forward, here we have a hypothetical 55 year old male who's been diagnosed with metabolic syndrome and grade three osteoarthritis in his right knee and grade one in his left. And then more specifically, his weight circumference is 48 inches, body fat percentage of 38. Uh, despite being on medications, his resting blood pressure is 142 over 88. Um, and there you see his fasting glucose and A1C numbers. He complains of a notice, he notices significant loss of strength conditioning and mobility over the past five years, difficulty ascending and descending stairs with associated with knee, knee pain. He's getting more winded easily, getting winded more easily, increasing difficulty getting up and down from the floor. Um, general deconditioning and knee pain are beginning to negatively affect his balance and his gait is starting to be affected. He's starting to reduce weight bearing on his affected or right side. Here, I just put a chart to be a little bit more clear about the criteria for metabolic syndrome, syndrome. You need to have at least three of the five following criteria in order to have that diagnosis. Uh, elevated waist circumference, and his obviously was above 40. The next two were not part of this case study, elevated triglycerides and reduced HCL. But the last two are, he has elevated blood pressure and he has elevated fasting glucose. He falls it within the standard of, or the criteria of metabolic syndrome. So the etiology of knee osteoarthritis. He has, he's been diagnosed with primary knee osteoarthritis, which means that the articular cartilage degeneration has no known cause. And the, pro, the pathological process for this condition is it begins with disruption in the equilibrium, which results in the disorganized pattern of collagen and the loss of articular cartilage elasticity. As time moves forward, this results in cracking and fissuring of the cartilage, which leads to erosion of the articular surface. The cartilage that's been damaged cannot recover. So once it's damaged, that's it. Unless, of course, you get um, knee replacement surgery or something like that the cartilage will continue to wear away. And once the cartilage is worn away, bony surfaces will start to be affected and the bone will expand and spurs will develop. The way this condition uh, presents clinically is that there are, there's pain upon movement, stiffness, particularly early morning stiffness, loss of range of motion or movement, 
pain after prolonged sitting or lying, pain on the joint line palpation, and joint enlargement. And then there are, technically there's five grades. There's grade zero, but uh, I just listed four grades, starting with grade one, which he has once again in his left knee, um, which really is just, um, they're not experiencing any pain. Just from an x-ray standpoint, you're starting to see minor bone spur growth, but there's no pain or discomfort. Grade two is where people are first starting to experience symptoms. They'll have pain after a long day of walking and will sense greater stiffness of the joint. It is a mild stage of the condition, but x-rays will already reveal greater bone spur growth. The cartilage will likely remain at a healthy size. Grade three, which is what this case study has, is moderate osteoarthritis. There's frequent pain during movement. Joint stiffness will also be more present, especially after sitting for long periods and in the morning. And the cartilage between the bones is starting to show obvious damage and the space between the bones is now reduced. And then the last stage is stage four. This is the most severe stage. The joint space between the bones is dramatically reduced, many times bone on bone. The cartilage will almost be completely gone and the synovial fluid will be decreased. This stage is normally associated with high levels of pain and discomfort during walking or moving the joint. Here I just put in a picture so that there could at least be a visual of what I just read. As you can see on the left side, stage one looks pretty normal. Stage two, your, the space is starting to narrow. Um, the, the cartilage is beginning to break down, but it's still fairly mild. Stage three, as this case study, now you are starting to, um, there's space, there's reduction in joint space and the gaps in the cartilage can expand until they reach the, the bone. And then stage four is at or near bone on bone, loss of cartilage reaches 60%. The next three slides is um, just some pictures of gross anatomy. I'm not really spending much time on any of them and I'm, I'm Definitely not going to spend much time on this one. And the reason why is because in four slides, I have a video of functional anatomy where I'll more specifically go over each muscle in the thigh. So here's basically just showing your quadricep muscles, your um, adductor muscles, pectineus, longus, gracilis, sartorius, etc. And then on the right side, we have the gluteus maximus. Your once again, your adductors and your hamstring muscles, the sem semitendinosus, your semimembranosis, semi um, and the biceps femoris, and then your uh, gastrocnemius down at the bottom, below the knee joint. And then from, I have a picture here of um, tendons and ligaments. Basically, the quads form a common tendon and attaches to the patella. And then from there, it attaches to the uh, tu tibial tuberosity via the patellar ligament. Um, and then from a bone standpoint, as you can see, we have your fibula, your tibia, your meniscus, both lateral and medial, your condyles, um, and obviously the femur up here. So there's a quick anatomy overview. I'm kind of assuming or hoping actually that my PowerPoints, I can, by the way, uh, Brendan, I can hand in my PowerPoint, turn it in so in case anyone wants the PowerPoint. Um, I can make sure that you and Andrew have it and then they can get copies of it. Okay. So in any case, I have now a um, quick video showing um, the functional anatomy of the adductors, the quads, and the hamstrings. And just for time's sake, because the most important part of this presentation is the uh, you know, the good stuff is the exercise program design. Um, I, I purposely kept this short. So here we have the entire muscle of the adductor adducting the thigh. And then it also is a hip, uh, an assistant hip flexion. And then let me actually reverse this and go back for a second. So an assistant hip flexion, the adductors do. And then here, if you look up top here, you'll see uh, I kind of go through and I click on each one. So here now we have the adductor magnus, which adducts and also is involved in hip internal rotation and hip extension. And 
then the pectineus. We'll get here in a second. Small muscle, which adducts and it also assists in hip flexion. The adductor brevis, which adducts, assists in hip internal rotation and hip flexion. Next is the adductor longus, which obviously um, does pretty much the same as the others. And then the thin little gracilis, which does multiple things. It adducts, assists in hip flexion, assists in knee flexion, and in knee internal rotation. And then lastly, or not lastly, I go over to the quadricep, and I kept this short. I didn't go to each individual one because they all do the same thing. Extend the knee. Here in an open chain movement and here in a closed chain movement. And then we go to the hamstring. And I kind of go through each one here. Here's the entire group flexing the knee extending the hip and extending the back in a closed chain movement. And then I quickly go through each one. Semi-tendinosis, pretty much doing the same stuff, but it's also a knee internal rotator. And the semi-tendinosis, same stuff, which is the reason why I didn't stay on it. Biceps femoris, assist in knee external rotation, and the long, that's the short head, and then the long head, knee extension, I'm sorry, flexion, hip extension, external rotation, and hip. So I know I purposely went through those fast because I figured that if anyone wanted me to go slow it up, I absolutely would and or I'll turn the PowerPoint in if they want to see this or they can just review muscleinmotion.com where I got the uh, videos from. Next. So I just want to throw some slides in because I wanted to kind of do a compare and contrast and uh, just kind of give a sense of what typically goes on in traditional acute physical therapy and compare, that, compare and contrast that with what I my approach, um, which I'm obviously heavily biased towards. So uh, here's some of the stuff you'll see in uh, traditional acute physical therapy. They might use hydrotherapy um, to help reduce the pain, taping, which works to offload the joint, similar to bracing. Um, manual therapy is going to be very common to help improve joint range of motion and potentially reduce pain as well. Massage may be useful to control pain in some subjects, putting a knee brace on them. Um, I personally, I'm not the biggest fan. You know, I, I know it's a case by case situation, but I personally am just not the biggest fan of using a, an, exter an external source of stability. Um, I understand you know, at, at some point, potentially in the rehab, you might need to do that but I just wouldn't want the person to get too reliant on that because we want internal stability via strengthening as the primary intervention for joint stability. And then they might use electrotherapy, which may help with the pain reduction, but the three biggest are gonna be to, hopefully they're going to counsel the person to increase their physical activity. And it, although it might be counterintuitive, the one thing we don't wanna do is sit around too long and you know, sit and lie around, you want to be active, you want to walk or do um, non-weight bearing exercise such as cycling or swimming or things like yoga and Tai Chi have all been shown to be beneficial for, knee osteo for individuals who've been diagnosed with knee osteoarthritis. And then obviously we want to, so what I'll do um, is, which is going to be very similar to what they'll do in physical therapy, except in physical therapy, they'll probably just do this locally where I'll do it 
globally. And that is a joint range of motion assessment. So with this particular individual, I would actually assess their joint range of motion from great toe to cervical spine and everything in between, because I wanna see with it where this individual is uh, restricted or tight, normal or hypermobile. And I also wanna see where asymmetries may exist and flexibility. I also just wanna see as I'm moving the person passively through the ranges of motion, um, kind of how tight it feels subjectively to them. And I'll even be looking at their face to get a sense of uh, apprehension as I'm moving through joint range of motion, because that will give me an idea of what I might need to be wary of, at least initially on the gym floor. So I'll, I'll um, assess joint range of motion with every single patient who is referred to me. Those are the things that, those are the reasons why I do it. So it's not just to look for areas where they're tight, normal, and hypermobile, is to look for all those other things as well, because I have enough experience now to know how tightness or apprehension, as an example, um, or discomfort, you know, where their discomfort is within the range of motion, if there is any, and how that might, that might manifest itself on the gym floor or just in general movement. So the, the joint range of motion assessment is, I honestly think it's critical. And I think that it is a shortcoming of the fitness field that trainers generally don't know their joint ranges of motion and don't, aren't assessing them. And instead they're doing things like, you know, an overhead squat test, which you would never want to do with this individual. Um, we should not be doing some sort of deep squat test to look at lower body mobility and they'll learn things like this. And then when they're, when they um, get a client such as this one with uh, grade three or grade four knee osteoarthritis, then a lot of times they're lost. They don't know what to do. Uh Oh, I can't do a, a deep squat with this person. Now what? And they don't know the alternatives. And ultimately, even in a deep knee squat, I'm just continuing to use that as an example, even if you could do that with someone like this, it's still not necessarily going to pinpoint exactly where they're tight, normal, or hypermobile. It's just going to give you an idea. You're still going to have to break it down. So why, to me, why go through the process of um, you know, starting with something that you're going to need to break down further to see what the exact issues are? Um, when you can just start right from the, from the foundation anyways. And it just doesn't take, once you know your joint range of motion, it just doesn't take that long to perform an assessment. Um, so I'm just heavily biased towards doing that. And then obviously we want to strengthen the individual, um, the whole body, but um, more specifically for this condition, their core and their lower kinetic chain. All right. This particular slide, I'm probably going to be including in every single presentation I give for the AOC, AOC PM&R because it is literally the framework for every single referral, whether it's disease and or uh, musculoskeletal condition. It literally doesn't matter their age. It doesn't matter what the condition or diagnosis is. Um, what I'm getting ready to show you is the framework for everything. And before I even go through it, I want to say, and I didn't create this as a slide, so I'm just kind of, I'm actually kind of reading off a, a, a Microsoft Word document I have in front of me. But since I knew I was going to give this presentation and I'm actually um, giving a, a, another one kind of similar tomorrow, I did a, um, an informal survey on Facebook yesterday and it was in two National Strength and Conditioning Association fitness groups, an American College of Sports Medicine fitness group, American Council on Exercise, National Academy of Sports Medicine, the International Society of, I can't remember the acronym, but it's ISSA, which is another fitness organization, my own timeline, and another fitness group. And I asked the question, how would you fitness trainers describe your training style? Because one of the things I've learned over the course of my 26-year career is that even though the two governing bodies in exercise science, the American College of Sports Medicine and the National Strength and Conditioning Association, highly suggest a periodized protocol, which I'm getting ready to explain on the slide, there are very few fitness trainers who know it. And if you don't know it, then you can't abide by it. And so as you're probably aware of, what typically goes on in the fitness field, and so what I did was I listed in my little question 
I listed some styles and I asked the trainers, which of these apply to you? Um, is, is it one? Is it more? Is it, uh, do you feel like they all apply to you? Um, et cetera. And the list is that your style is the workout of the day, or in other words, you're just constantly switching things up and there's really no rhyme or reason to your um, fitness training methods. The next one was a heavy focus on making the sessions fun and entertaining. The next one was more of a bodybuilder or aesthetics focused training style. The next was that they prefer, it's the tra type of trainer who prefers high repetitions with lighter weights, a trainer who prefers lower repetitions with heavier weights, such as a five by five training style, which is very popular in the fitness field, a military style, strong man or power lifter, a corrective or therapeutic focused training style, functional or other. So that was my list. And once again, I, I posted in this like, like seven different groups. I got a lot of responses and almost none of them said periodization. Even the ones in the NSCA and ACSM groups, almost nobody said periodization and a progressive focused um, you know, training style. The most popular ones by far where the workout of the day, where you're, you know, like, like uber variety, where you're constantly switching things up, um, or a heavy focus on making the fun, the, the sessions fun and entertaining. Um, and then uh, the other two most popular ones were corrective and therapeutic focused or functional focus, which is a very ambiguous term. So maybe, maybe in the future, I'll do a presentation or part of a presentation on just that alone. So you can be a little bit more aware because I'd like to be able to compare and contrast in more detail those styles versus what I'm getting ready to show you, but I just don't have time in today's session. But this is how I've learned to go about it. I'm, I just think it's common sense. Um, and I honestly just wish that every trainer would do it because you literally can take those other styles and insert them into what I'm getting ready to show. And that is ACSM and NSEA guidelines basically break down program design into two categories. In, there's the initial program design, which is also known as the familiarization phase. It's also known as the adaptation phase, where the body is now adapting to the, a new, the new stress of exercise, and in this case, resistance training. And then you're only in that, it's the initial stage, so you're only in there for so long. It could be two or three weeks, it could be several months, it just kind of depends on the situation. And then from there, once you get out of the initial stage, or actually before I even get to that, basically what's going on, the initial stage closely mimics traditional physical therapy. You typically start at somewhere around 10 repetitions per set, which is very common in physical therapy. It's low RPE, or in other words, low intensity. You're, you're teaching the individual proper form. You're determining the, the appropriate exercise selection and their pain-free range of motion. Um, you're teaching them names of exercise, flow of the session, and helping develop mind-muscle connections via verbal, visual, and tactile cueing. So that's what that initial stage looks like, and it typically lasts for a few weeks to several months. It just depends on the individual, their conditions, their fitness level, their learning curve, et cetera. But basically, the end of this phase is determined by they're, they're, they're becoming familiar enough with the exercises that you don't have to cue them as much. Um, and and, and that, that part of the learning curve is now significantly diminished. You've increased the intensity during this phase so that the workouts are no longer like in the warm up. The intensity of the, of the loading is no longer in the warm up range. You're now kind of progressing them through the warm up intensity continuum. And now they've at least gotten to the point where they're on the lower end. The intensity is at the lower end of a true working set. And, and, um, to be honest with you, once they're at that point, it's time to take the training wheels off and start progressing them. And the most, so what the ACSM and NSCA suggests, which just isn't happening for the most part in the field of fitness, is starting them off on a linear periodization model, where, for example, you will move them from the 10 repetitions per set they, will, they were doing in the initial program design to, you'll actually move them to 12 to 15 typically with about the same loads, and you'll stay there for like a three to four week phase where the primary purpose within that phase is to get them stronger. So that at the end of the phase, let's say a month later, they're a little bit stronger in every exercise at the end of the month than they were 
in week one. That prepares their mind and their body for when you reduce the repetitions by two, it's just a small reduction. So it's just a small increase in, in load. You stay there for a three to four week phase and same goal. Uh, there's more goals than this, but the primary goal is to get them stronger. So at the end of the phase, they're a little stronger than they were in week one, which then prepares the mind and the body to reduce two reps. It's a small reduction. So it's a small increase in, in weight. It doesn't really, it doesn't really, uh, it's not a shock to them. Like, oh, I'm, I'm lifting so much more weight in this phase. In week one, for each phase, you're actually only lifting a little more weight as it was compared to the previous. Um, so it's just a nice flow from one rep range to the next. And then you'd have to decide on based on the person whether or not they can move down to six to eight, or if we want to swing back up around in the 12 to 15 range and go through it again. There's also nonlinear periodization, which I just don't have time to, uh, it's outside of the scope of this presentation to explain what that is. Um, but generally speaking, th the reason why that's in the big circle is because this is the general framework of what a program should look like, at least from a repetition and loading standpoint. From a volume standpoint, you would start them at like one, two, one to two sets per, per muscle group. And with the ultimate goal of, un of understanding that adaptations don't really begin to be optimized until you're reaching about um, 10 sets per muscle group per week. So if you're only doing say three sets within the scope of a session, then you'd need to get three sets in, I'm sorry, three sessions in during the week just to make it to nine total sets. So I just think it's important for clinicians to understand this because if your patient is always on this low, like for instance, home exercise programs, where it's always 10 repetitions per set, it's, they're not progressing through a variety of repetition ranges. They're only ever doing two or three sets per muscle group, like twice per week, maybe three times a week. They're, they're almost never going to get out of a beginner domain of strength. And, and the problem with that is we need that to happen for the tissue, um, both, both muscle tissue and secondary soft tissue to increase in its uh, ability to tolerate stressors and resiliency. So if they're always, they're always in beginner range, that technically means they're always weak and we don't want that. So it's, it's just another reason why patients really should either be guided through the physical therapy domain into the fitness and wellness domain and not stop with home exercise programs or bypass physical therapy when you feel it's appropriate and go directly to a qualified exercise specialist. Um, in any case, and other things we want to do that we wanna insert in this, into this overall framework that I just described is you just wanna make sure that you're balancing strength and flexibility and that you're ensuring, ensuring proper form. With balancing flexibility, all that means is that you've done your joint range of motion assessment, you now know where the restrictions are and you place them on a proper program to move those tight areas back to being normal. And by doing that, you're going to balance their flexibility as long as they're compliant. Proper form is a given. And what I mean by balanced strength is I also am a believer that fitness professionals should know, generally speaking, strength balance ratios. So for instance, you know, it's common in sports medicine to know that quad to hamstring strength balance is three to two. The quad should be a little bit stronger than the hamstrings. That same strength balance ratio applies to the abductors and adductors, uh, where the adductors should be uh, a little stronger than the abductors. And then another example would be from the chest and back standpoint or push-pull. You'd want it to be about a one-to-one -one ratio for shoulder and neck health, or some literature will say a five-to-four ratio where your pull is a little bit stronger than your push. So you don't want your chest to be stronger than your back. You either want them to be about the same or, um, or your back slightly stronger. But the point is that we should know that, you know, I'm just a huge believer that we should know this stuff and it's just not happening enough in the fitness field. And if you go back to these training styles where it's mix things up and uber variety, um, fun and entertaining, uh, always doing light loads, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Where is the person showing the understanding that there's actually more to it than that? We need to balance their strength. We need to balance their flexibility for joint health. And so that's just another reason why I'm not the biggest fan of a lot of these 
training styles out there and, and heavily biased towards this because a it's you know it's the governing body guidelines and b it, it inserts sports medicine concepts within it that are just common sense so another um, really important thing to insert is readiness to train this is now just making sure that every single session you're asking them certain questions which i'll get to in a later slide to make sure that they are actually you know that they've eaten and taken their medications etc and that they and that they're ready to train and then, and that if they're not feeling well for some reason or something like that you are the trainer is um adjusting accordingly so in other words maybe they just need to reduce the volume reduce the intensity or choose different exercises based on how the person answers the question the questions and then you have two types of special considerations one is for um disease and in this case it's metabolic syndrome which i'll get to in a later slide but you have to consider their the how you need to adjust the program based on their diagnosis and you also have joint friendly exercises which are your musculoskeletal special considerations which i will get to in a later slide by the way before i move on any questions or comments on any of that stuff all right good oh go ahead no i'm good i was gonna say i'm good <laughs> okay good so uh i expected that brennan otherwise you would have been in trouble um, all right, so I'll go to the next slide. The reason why I put this slide in is just a friendly reminder that there is a strength endurance continuum and there is a strength um, part of the strength endurance continuum, which generally speaking goes from the one to 20 repetition range. So um, object, objectively speaking, in the one to four repetition range, assuming you're loading up so that you can only perform one to four repetitions, that is known as very heavy weight. At the other end of the continuum in the 15 to 20 repetition range, that is um, where you can only perform 15 to 20 and you loaded so that you couldn't perform any more than that. That's known as very lightweight. And then you have everything in between, heavy, moderate, and light. The, if, you, if you go back to my to the slide, you'll see that the repetition ranges that are recommended basically run from six to 15. So now going back to this slide, if you look that basically what that means is that you're actually spending most of your time, the ACSM and NSEA guidelines are suggesting that you spend most of your time in the moderate to light range with some time in the heavy range. This is for the general population. For athletes, that's going to be skewed down more to the 1 to 12 repetition range. But for the general population, the suggestion is that they're spending most of their time in the 6 to 15 or some literature might say 4 to 15 repetition range. But the point is, most of that time is actually spent lifting moderate to light weights. And as we move through the, the, the remaining slides of this presentation, I wanna point that out because we're not asking these individuals who have been diagnosed with disease or musculoskeletal issues to lift heavy weights in, for the most part. We're asking them, and even if so, they've started with light weights and then they're systematically reducing the load, I'm sorry, reducing the repetition range and increasing the loads so that their body is, is adapting and getting a little stronger and a little bit more resilient as you move through the repetition continuum so that by the time they do get down to six repetitions, um, as compared with eight repetitions, it's just not that much of a decrease. And in most cases, I've learned that most people can tolerate even six repetitions per set, even with the conditions that this particular case study has. So I just wanna point that stuff out. Um, Special considerations now for metabolic syndrome. Uh, with obesity, all that really means is that we need to have increased sensitivity to their mobility issues. Um, in other words, like for instance, if you go back to the first slide in this presentation, this particular gentleman was um, starting to struggle, finding difficulty getting up and down from the floor. So from a trainer standpoint, we don't want to put them on the floor, or at least we want to have increased sensitivity to that. And maybe, for example, have a stool there or something that they can push off of to help them get up if for some reason you feel like it's necessary to get them on the floor for a certain exercise. And also, they're going to have apprehensions, um, even just about how they feel about themselves and maybe the environment they're in. So the trainer just needs to be more insensitive to, to that. When it comes to their hypertension, early on, I would highly suggest that we, we at least established that their resting blood pressure is controlled. Um, and that it's below 160 systolic over 110 diastolic. 
Um, you can still resistance train in that range, um, but but now you have to make sure that you reduce that. First of all, they've been medically cleared. Um, in this case, the person was 145 over 88, I believe. So it's not up in that range. I'm just making a point that if it is up around 160 over 110, you actually can still exercise according to ACSM guidelines, but you just have to be, you just have to start reducing your intensity at that point, um, et cetera. And so in any case, you'd want to take their blood pressure early on, just to establish a theme that they really are taking their medications, that they're in that um, resting range that they claim they're in. Um, and oh, I'm sorry, let me, oops, let me go back. We also just may want to make sure that the program is RPE based, or in other words, that the sets are submaximal, that you are terminating them appropriately and not taking them to muscle failure. Uh, you want to make sure that you terminate sets that's at least two or three repetitions shy of muscle failure, which I've also found is, you know, because there's an, there's an initial phase where you actually are starting at RPEs below that, starting at like RPE of four or five, where it's like a warm up set, you're, you're, most people can tolerate a seven, almost everybody can tolerate a seven on a scale of one to 10, which is a true working set. Um, and I've even found that most people can tolerate, eventually they can be progressed to tolerating a seven and a half or an eight. I usually stay away from nines and tens with just about anyone. And I absolutely would with this person since they have hypertension, we'd only go in like the seven to eight range, but I've absolutely found that most people can be progressed to tolerating that. Um, as long as we are educating them on breathing and making sure they're not holding their breath, uh, avoiding the Valsalva maneuver where their glottis is closed, um, and that we educate them and that we as a trainer understand the signs and symptoms uh, they might experience if they're having some sort of hypertension-related flare-up, such as, and these aren't all of them, I just listed some, headache, chest pain, chest tightness, heart palpitations, unusual fatigue as examples. Special considerations for metabolic syndrome. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry for type 2 diabetes. So you're going to really want to have sensitivity to the readiness to train questions, which I have on, I think, the next slide. Um, and early on, you want to, this isn't necessarily a, a requirement from the ACSM and the American Diabetes Association, but I would just suggest that early on, you make sure that their blood glucose has been checked so that you can establish a controlled theme, or in other words, that their blood glucose is not below 120 milligrams per deciliter is preferably not above 300, but the truth is the guidelines say that it can be above 300 as long as there's no presence of ketones and they feel well. But in that case, you would want to reduce their intensity uh, the, of resistance training to moderate. So, um, so that actually was surprising to me when I first learned this. I thought initially that the safe range was 120 to 300, but once again, it's actually okay if it's above 300, as long as there's no ketones and they feel it. And then once again, the signs and symptoms that I went over um, briefly in the previous slide, we want to make sure we understand those, especially as it relates to um, hypoglycemic reaction. And early on in their program design, we also don't want to have short rest periods between sets because um, they're deconditioned and we don't want them to be battling, you know, this be out of breath. And then you're already asking them to do a, uh, a, their next set of resistance training before they've even recovered. We want their heart and breathing rate early on to return back to at or near resting level and allow them to first just adapt to the new exercise of, I'm, I'm sorry, the new stress of exercise. And then we can slowly start to adjust rest periods between sets to, especially in the higher repetition ranges, to start getting them uh, more conditioned um, and develop some stamina. Here are the readiness to train questions. They should be asked prior to every single session without fail. How, did you, how do you feel? How did your body respond to the last session? When and what did you last eat? Are you hydrated? Have you taken your medications? Are you on any new medications? Blood sugar, blood pressure check. And is there anything else you'd like me to be aware of prior to the workout? So these are the readiness to train questions and they are critical for the, so from your standpoint as a, you know, physician or um, physician to be a future physician. If I were in your position, 
I would really, this, this is critical information to know because I would be asking my actually physical therapists and um, trainers, are you, are you aware of these questions? Are you asking them prior to every single session? And are you making sure that you make the appropriate adjustments if they say, yeah, I'm, I feel like I'm catching a cold or I didn't sleep well last night or I forgot to take my medications, you know, or something, uh, you know, et cetera. Haven't eaten in a while. You need to know these things in order to uh, make the appropriate um, adjustments. And let me also say, and I, I might be repeating it on another slide, but it's, it's worth repeating. What I found um, in the, basically over the course of my career, I have absolutely flared up clients. Fortunately, it's never been horrific, but I have absolutely flared them up. And what I have found through experience is that it's pretty much always been my fault. It's pretty much always because I didn't ask them the readiness to train questions, or maybe it was a situation where they, I did ask them and they were on a new medication, but didn't tell me. But I found that if you ask these questions and then if you make sure that you take them through a graded warm up so that the warm up starts nice and light and ends moderately, and that your first working sets of your exercises are also kind of graded so that maybe they're on a six or a seven, six or six and a half on a scale of one to 10 on the first working set. And then on the next one, you start getting into that seven, seven and a half range, a little bit closer to muscle failure. If you do those things, the chances of having some sort of flare up, whether it's musculoskeletal or related to whatever their uh, disease is, is little to none, pretty much won't happen. So that's the reason why these questions are critical. And it's, and it's also the reason why it's critical for um, clinicians to understand this and to ensure that who they're referring their patients to are asking these questions. Okay, my next several slides are videos, but they're very short. I think this one is only like, 50 seconds in length or something like that. Just want to give a quick idea of like, there's obviously a million core exercises. So I just gave a general idea of, of core exercises I might begin this um, particular case study with. We obviously have to strengthen every major muscle group in their body, including their core. So if, if, they're, if, they're, um, if their core is really deconditioned, if it's weak, I might start off with a, um, a Pilates mat exercise like this, uh, march or heel tap, whatever you want to call it. And also notice, you know, this is, this is my wife, by the way, but I, I absolutely would try to make sure that, well, I'm sorry, if, if the, in a perfect world situation, you would want the facility that you're working at to have a table such as this, that you have access to for the obese person who is with grade three knee osteoarthritis, who is apprehensive and is having difficulty getting up and down from the floor so that you can do something like this. And if you, if you don't have access to it, then that's where the creativity and critical thinking is going to have to come into play because you might not want to put this person on the floor. They're apprehensive about it. So you might want to, you might need to do your um, core exercises, like for instance, on the cable machine. Um, but in any case, it might start off with something as easy as this, or we might progress to, a slow bicycle. I think I just showed like two repetitions here. Oh, there's one. Or maybe some sort of a, of a dying bug. Slow and controlled. Here's a modified version of Pilates hundreds where the knees are a little bit more bent than you'd typically find. Let me hit pause. This is just a cable anti-rotation. So um, they're just, it's, it's just resist, it's just resisting the, uh, resisting the rotation with a load and working the obliques from a stability standpoint. Here's a modified crunch, taking the lumbar spine out of the equation and it's just thoracic spine. Here's a cable rotation as an example. From low to high, you'd wanna do it from different angles. So there's just some examples of core exercises I would have them do, but more, more specifically and to give more clarity, I'd make sure that their program includes core stabilizers like you saw in the early part of the video where, just, where the core is not moving and um, core movers where we're doing rotations, lateral bends um, and crunches as examples to, get, uh, to work both the movers and the stabilizers. Next, I just wanna give some examples. We, you know, with knee osteoarthritis, you absolutely need to strengthen the hips or more specifically, the abductors and adductors. So I just want to give examples of exercises I would have them perform. 
I might start with um, something simple like this adductor exercise, or maybe if we have access to a machine like this, here's a, a client pulling you know, a cable adduction where they're pulling in while they're standing. And then here's some classic hip abductor exercises like the classic sideline clam, the sideline leg raise with an ankle weight. Here's side stepping with a TheraBand. All of these should be safe with someone with obesity, hypertension, or I'm sorry, metabolic syndrome, and knee osteoarthritis. If you have any questions on any of that towards the end, please let me know. Then, so now what I did is, this is a longer video. I can't remember how long it is, but I think it's somewhere in the two and a half to three minute range. Um, quickly flying through some lower body exercises I would have this person perform, but I am going to speak a little bit more. I'm going to stop this a few times and, and, and give you some views I have based on my experience. So in, in physical therapy, this is going to be a really standard exercise for this type of, of patient with grade three knee osteoarthritis, a, a body weight bridge, maybe bilaterally, maybe unilaterally as a progression, as an example of progression. But here's an example of a hip barbell hip thrust, and I'm going to stop for a sec. For whatever it's worth, I am a huge believer in using, and I've described this in an earlier presentation, I think my first presentation for the AOC PM&R, what I call the RPE method, where you combine RPE, scale of one to 10, so you're basically asking the client, how did that set feel on the lat, on a scale, on a scale of one to 10, how did the last repetition of that set feel? And then you obviously have to define it more, but that's where the other uh, variables come into play, um, which is the look of strain on their face. It's called face of effort. And there really is a lot of uh, half decent amount of research on this. Um, and we just know those who, of us who lift know that once you start getting close to muscle failure, you're, you're, you're going to naturally strain your face and, and there's nothing you can do about it. So that's known as face of effort. And, and if there was no face of effort, then it was probably a warm up set. If there was a face of effort, then it was probably a working set or at least in that range. But the most important uh, variable is the, the slowing of the velocity of movement. So I am just the biggest biased believer that you need to know this concept. And even in physical therapy, it is just barely being used. Not the concept as a whole. They might say they use RPE scales, but what I found for the most part is that, is that they're and look, I'm painting a broad brush and this isn't completely fair, but what I found is a lot of what's going on in rehab, and I'm also pointing fingers back in the, at the fitness field as well, is asking the, the patient, was that challenging enough? That might be okay for the first two sessions um, to, to you know, establish trust and a nice comfortable baseline, but the practitioner or the coach should have enough of a skill set that it only takes about two sessions and then you're taking the ball from them and you aren't asking them that question anymore, you're relying on your own expertise. And more specifically, you're, you're watching them and making sure that there's a look of strain on the face, at least starting to enter the equation and the velocity of movement slowing so that you know that it was a true working set because otherwise they're gonna stay in beginner range of strength. Uh, we're not gonna get that tissue strength and resiliency we want. So the reason why I'm saying all this is because I found that even with someone with grade three and grade four, bone on bone, knee osteoarthritis, I am quickly taking the training wheels off of um, bridges, even, even single leg bridges. And I'm quickly moving them to th these like barbell hip thrusts. Why? Because your glute hamstring complex is probably the strongest muscle group in the body. And I even have, for example, a 76 year old female client She's been training with me for like seven or eight years. So we didn't start with this. We progressed to it, but she's 76. She weighs 112 pounds. And I have her hip thrusting in the 100 to 140 pound range. And she also has some osteoarthritis in her knee and other issues in her knee as well. And I have her um, hip thrusting more than her body weight for like six, eight, 10 reps, even 12 reps. Um, so these body weight bridges and stuff like that, that should be, you know, just the very beginning. And we should graduate them quickly to barbell hip thrust with some sort of load. The reason why I'm a fan of leg press for knee osteoarthritis, even though it might seem counterintuitive, as long as this 
particular case study, this person is comfortable getting in the leg press apparatus, which I used to, my first job out of college was at Duke University Medical Center's Diet and Fitness Center, which is, uh, they build themselves as the leading uh, medical weight loss facility in the United States. Um, we had leg press machines there and, and, you know, this, this, these were obese and some cases morbidly obese, uh, individuals who came there to lose weight and not all of them, but a, a large percentage were comfortable getting in and out of a leg press apparatus, as long as you demonstrated them how to do it properly and safely. And the reason why I'm a big fan of leg press for, um, as a knee friendly exercise is because you can load up less than their body weight. So like, for instance, a, a body weight sits to stand is still their body weight. And if they're heavy, it's, it's a half decent amount of body weight. But on a leg press, you could technically just, just do the, you know, the sled. Or if it's, if it's a, where you put the pins in, you technically could just do 10, 20, 30 pounds. So you can really start sub body weight and then progress them over time. You can also, it's a lot easier to manage and, um, and, uh, instruct their joint range of motion and start off with like the lightest weight possible, make sure that they found their um, available pain-free range of motion, and then slowly load them up from there, remaining in their pain-free range of motion. So I'm a big fan of leg press, if the facility has it, as a knee-friendly exercise. Next would be, so deadlifts. Any style of deadlifts is going to be a knee-friendly exercise for most knee conditions, including this one. And the reason why is because Look at the starting position. The knees barely flexed at all. So it has, it has about 140 degrees capacity to flex. And we're only flexing it depending on the situation, 10, 20, 30 degrees, maybe 40 degrees. So it's only a fraction of its capacity. And then you're contracting the posterior chain while you're performing the exercise, which is stabilizing and decompressing the knee. So deadlifts are a very knee-friendly exercise. You might want to start them with a rack pull or maybe something like this which isn't ideal, but you know, you got to make do with what you have. And then you slowly progress them to the floor. And for example, I'm going to press stop again. I had a client for eight years, um, trained him till he was 80 years old. We started at 72 and trained him till he was 80. He had grade four knee osteoarthritis. We absolutely progressed to what you're seeing in this video. Um, it took a little while, but we progressed or I progressed him to trap bar deadlifts where he was pulling from the floor and he was pain-free despite being bone on bone. And actually he still golfed and it actually really helped. He said that it really helped his golf game by, by, by performing this exercise and, and taking away a lot of that knee pain, stabilizing his knee. So deadlifts. Now here's just an example of a goblet squat with a kettlebell. I think that is cable goblet squat. The one thing that's not going to be the case is we're definitely not going to have this person going this deep. We're going to do an assessment and, and find his available pain-free range of motion. And as long as his knee bend, let me back up just a hair. As long, so this is about, if you can see, this is approximately a 45 or a 50 degree angle. Research shows that it's that the most stress on the knee is from zero to 60 degrees. So from zero to about a quarter squat or a little below a core squat is the most stress on the knee. So the point is that before you, in my opinion, before we load up, load the person up on squats, we want to make sure that they have an available range of motion that's greater than 60 degrees. So 90 degrees would be approximately a half squat where the thigh is parallel to the ground. It actually doesn't need to be quite that deep before you start loading up, in my opinion. Um, at the very least, we still want to take them, they're sitting to stand every day. So at the very least we should be doing body weight squats within their pain-free range of motion, no matter what it is. But the point is that I might load this person up with some sort of uh, goblet squat, whether it's cable or dumbbell within their pain-free range of motion. But I am absolutely not going to be averse, averse to uh, barbell back squat because we can, you know, this particular person hasn't been diagnosed with any low back issues. And as, if they can, if they aren't apprehensive about it, I am, I'm a believer that if you can sit to stand with proper form, you can do it against resistance. And if you can do it against resistance, we are squatting. And if you aren't apprehensive about doing a barbell back squat, we're doing it as long as you can get your appropriate depth. So I absolutely would progress this person as soon as possible to barbell back squats 
maybe not necessarily in the lower repetition ranges with heavier weights, but definitely in the higher repetitions with lighter weights, as long as they were willing to do it. And that's just the job of me doing my coaching work. Front squats, if they have the mob wrist mobility and lat mobility to be able to do them. Here's an example of a lunge or a stationary squat, forward uh, stationary lunge, whatever you want to call it, that they might be able to do where you're just reducing the range of motion within their pain-free available range of motion. So they absolutely, they could potentially do this exercise. You just have to um, know to how to reduce the range of motion and make it safe. Maybe we'd actually start with two Airx pads and really reduce the range of motion first, get them comfortable doing this exercise and increasing their strength, and then take an Airx pad away and get, have them go a little bit deeper as a progression. And then uh, shortened arc knee extensions such as this, or on a cable machine, as you can see, this is shortened arc knee extension within their pain-free range of motion is appropriate. Um, knee, absolutely, we got to strengthen the hamstrings because they're a knee stabilizer and we got to strengthen the posterior chain. So um, knee, ex, knee curls should absolutely be part of the program. And then the gastrocnemius crosses the knee, therefore it serves as the knee stabilizer. Therefore, we would also want to include calf raises with the knee straight as part of the program. Um, and that's it for this video. So that's actually it for the uh, presentation with the, with the exception of, I wanna just reiterate that combining, and I'm actually gonna do a, I'm gonna stop. Well, actually, no, I won't stop the share screen. Combining um, diagnosis is not that, once you know what the overall framework is, once you know the ACSM and NSCA's guidelines for periodization, you once you understand that period that program design is broken into two phases, where you do start with a nice conservative familiarization and adaptation phase, where you are being very conservative and allow the, allowing their body to safely adapt to the stressors of exercise, while you're simultaneously learning their body from a coach's standpoint, and um, you know, finding the appropriate exercises, um, their available pain-free range of motion, et cetera. Once you've gone through that phase and you're making sure that every single session you're asking them the readiness to train questions so you know whether or not you need to adjust the session based on the answers to their questions and, and you're doing a good job of balancing flexibility, balancing strength around each joint to create the homeostasis that the body wants and needs. And if you understand what your joint-friendly exercises are, and in this case, it's gonna be leg press, um, hip thrusts, you know, bridges and hip thrusts, uh, um, deadlift variations, and potentially squat, and even a stationary lunge within their pain-free available range of motion. Then, then from there, if you add in a disease, whether in this case it's metabolic syndrome, or let's say we add in fibromyalgia or, or lupus or multiple sclerosis, et cetera, in that case, it's just knowing your special considerations, which almost always manifests itself in the need to back off of intensity and volume. So as long as you're you know, grading the warm up, appropriately backing off in intensity and volume, understanding your, um, your exercise selection, making sure to establish trust so that they aren't, aren't apprehensive about anything you're doing with them, et cetera, really the overall um, framework and, and, and program design just isn't that difficult. You just need to know these things. And once again, and lastly, if you compare this approach to constantly switching things up where you're not concerned about um, balancing, you know, strength around joints and you're not, you're not progressing them in strength in a nice systematic fashion or making sure that it's fun and entertaining, you know, or some of these other styles that are out there. What are you going to do when someone actually has a situation where they're, what they've been diagnosed with is on the severe end. You know, that's just not going to work in my biased opinion. So that's just another reason why I feel like this approach is just really just should be the, the uh, prototype approach and for, for any type of diagnosis. And, um, and it just makes sense. And it, and it follows both sports medicine, medicine, and um, exercise science guidelines. So with all that said, thank you so much for watching and listening to my babbling and any questions or comments.
I'm good. Andrew, how are you doing? You don't have to talk, but <laughs> he said I'm good. Okay, cool. All right, good. All right. So hopefully that made sense. Okay. And, and, and Brennan, for your knowledge, since you know, you're know you helping to moderate these presentations, mm -hmm. this is going to be a, a theme that happens now with each presentation. I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, it's going to be the theme. And, and so okay. really it's, it's just a matter of drilling the theme into the, 